This is CBN News Watch. Thanks for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm Mark Martin. It's a game of chicken as President Trump threatens a new round of trade actions on China, a move that sent stocks plunging Monday. CBN's White House correspondent Ben Kennedy has this look at the growing escalation of economic tensions between the U.S. and China and their potential impact. President Trump is not backing down on China. This round of tariffs targets four times as many goods to the tune of $200 billion. Fears of a trade war builds after President Trump threatens a new 10% tariff on $200 billion of Chinese imports. We're talking about uh, cell phones, we're talking about computers, we're talking about toys, we're talking all about a lot about electric gadgets that we get from uh, China. Trump's move comes after China slapped the U.S. with $50 billion in tariffs, itself a retaliation for previous U.S. tariffs on Chinese goods. Our past leaders should have never allowed China to get to a point where there's a $500 billion trade deficit with the United States. And they're accusing us of not playing by the rules? I mean, come on, what's wrong with that picture? Stephen Moore advised Trump during his campaign when he highlighted free and fair trade. Steve, you worked with Trump on the campaign trail mm -hmm. during that time. He said he planned to be tough on China. That's Do you for see sure. this as a campaign promise kept? Oh, absolutely. China calls this action blackmail and is prepared to up the ante with more retaliatory tariffs. Do you fear this move by President Trump could actually spark a trade war? It could. Yeah, we could see a trade war. I don't want to see one. Donald Trump doesn't want to see one. We have no control over what another country does in retaliation. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross defended Trump's tariffs during a Senate Finance Committee hearing where lawmakers expressed their concerns. I'm increasingly concerned that the tariffs, both those in place and those that have been proposed, are going to hurt American consumers and our domestic businesses, especially in the agricultural sector far more than they're going to persuade the Chinese to change their unfair trade practices. Stephen Moore says odds are good that both sides will meet soon to stop the tariffs. In the meantime, expect more tough talk until they reach a compromise. Ben Kennedy, CBN News, Washington. Here's a look now at some of the other major stories we're following in the CBN newsroom today. The Trump administration has scaled back a key element of its zero-tolerance immigration policy. Customs and Border Protection officials saying that President Trump's order last week to stop splitting families at the border required a temporary halt to prosecuting parents and guardians unless they had a criminal history. This while Trump continues to call for immediate deportation, saying that immigrants who cross the border illegally don't deserve due process. White House officials say the Trump administration is asking Congress for a permanent solution as the U.S. is running out of resources to keep people together. Meanwhile, President Trump traveled to South Carolina Monday. He was there to campaign for GOP Governor Henry McMaster, although critics say he made it about himself. His speech touched it touched on trade issues, his problem with the Democrats, the immigration debate, and his 2016 election. Voters take to the polls for South Carolina's primary runoff election today. Classmates and community members gathered yesterday to remember 17-year-old Antoine Rose. The unarmed teen was shot and killed by police last Tuesday during a traffic stop outside of Pittsburgh. His death sparked days of protests with many calling for justice for Antoine. The shooting is still being investigated. For more on these and other stories, visit CBNNews.com. The U.S. Supreme Court has decided not to hear the case of Baronel Stutzman, a Christian florist who was fined for refusing to provide flowers for a same-sex wedding. Instead, the high court ordered the Washington Supreme Court to take a fresh look at the case. Stutzman maintained she was exercising her First Amendment rights when she refused to provide flowers for a gay wedding, explaining it goes against her Christian beliefs. Trump administration officials and other Republicans have been targeted in public places in recent days, including White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders, who was asked to leave a Virginia restaurant over the weekend simply because she works for President Trump. The intense backlash comes partly as a response to the administration's actions in separating families at the border. Charlene Aaron has the story. Protests against Trump administration policies has turned into public harassment of officials. White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders getting kicked out of a restaurant. 
and protesters outside the home of Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen. Shame! 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 Protesters shouting, you're a horrible person, basically chased Florida Attorney General and Trump supporter Pam Bondi out of a Tampa movie theater. California Democrat Maxine Waters fanned flames by encouraging confrontation. If you see anybody from that cabinet in a restaurant, in a department store, at a gasoline station, you get out and you create a crowd and you push back on them. President Trump warned Waters, tweeting, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, an extraordinarily low IQ person, be careful what you wish for, Max. Sanders addressed the incident in Monday's press briefing. We are allowed to disagree, but we should be able to do so freely and without fear of harm. And this goes for all people, regardless of politics. Dan Gaynor of the Media Research Center says the left-wing media is partly to blame. Oh, well, if Congress is okay, so many Congress is okay with this, uh, then that's fine. The issue has also been a problem on the right. In 2007, rocker Ted Nugent called for then-Democratic presidential candidates Obama and Clinton be assassinated. But Gaynor says the problem is expanding. We're seeing not just the, the incidents, but the tenor of things has been ratcheted up to the point that the left doesn't want anyone they disagree with to be able to go to a school without confrontation, a restaurant, a movie, go shopping and certainly even go to your work or go to your home. Democratic leaders strongly disagree with Waters. No one should call for the harassment of political opponents. That's not right. That's not American. Yesterday, a sign of hope. This picture of former presidents Bill Clinton and George H.W. Bush reminding us that political rivals can also be friends. In a recent editorial, Republican Senator Orrin Hatch issued a call for civility, saying we all bear the responsibility in some way for the current state of politics and the lack of civility. And because of that, it takes commitment from all of us to fix it. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. The press secretary who made the Daily White House press briefing must see TV is returning to the small screen. Sean Spicer is developing a TV show where he'll talk to public figures about a variety of topics from media to sports to marriage. A spokesman for the show confirms a pilot episode titled Sean Spicer's Common Ground is being produced. The New York Times first reported the story. The paper says Spicer will focus on having respectful conversations. As press secretary Spicer shattered traditions in the briefing room, skipping over major outlets to call on other organizations like CBN News. At least seven people have died in a fresh wave of violence in Nicaragua. After more than two months, there are few signs the unrest is subsiding. And in an exclusive interview with CBN News, the Nicaraguan president's stepdaughter says the world is finally seeing the true nature of Daniel Ortega. Gary Lane has the story. This is a scene all too common in Nicaragua. Another funeral for a victim of recent political violence. <laughs> More than 200 people have died in the past two months. And now the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights says the government has violated human rights. The UN Commissioner on Human Rights says most of the deaths have come at the hands of police forces and pro-government groups, including allegedly the use of snipers that have led to the wounding of at least 1,500 people. The gravity of these developments may well merit an international commission of inquiry. Protests began when the government made changes to the country's social security system. They soon grew into deadly clashes between pro and anti-government forces. The unrest comes of no surprise to President Daniel Ortega's stepdaughter, Zoila America Ortega Mario, who now lives in Costa Rica. She suggests Nicaraguans are tired of government corruption, and she says her stepfather is an immoral man. In 1998, Zoila America went public with allegations that Ortega sexually abused her when she was nine years old. Everybody was defending Daniel Ortega because of his power, but when I discovered that I really was a child of God, and that from him, I can start a new life and, and a new birth. In this moment, I understand that God is 
not is the perfect father. And now, 20 years later, she says Nicaraguans and the world may finally believe she was sexually abused by the Sandinista leader. The Nicaraguan people is starting to, uh, to a process of awakening to knowing who is Daniel Ortega really. And maybe now they can say, yes, Daniel Ortega is capable of making sexual abuse too, because he's an abuser. At the beginning, abusing a girl and now abusing a country. Gary Lane, CBN News. Coming up, a look at the new book that shows the prophetic changes since Israel became a nation. Prince William has touched down in Israel, becoming the first member of the British royal family to visit the region. His busy tour begins with a visit to Jerusalem's Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial. The memorial recognizes William's great-grandmother on his father's side, Princess Alice, for her role in rescuing Jews during the Holocaust. She hid three members of the Cohen family in her palace in Athens during the Nazi occupation. Today, the Duke is set to meet two survivors who escaped Nazi Germany for the safety of Britain. Nearly 3,000 years ago, Hebrew prophets wrote about how the land of Israel would be transformed. Now a new book shows the remarkable and even prophetic changes in that land in the 70 years since Israel became a nation. Chris Mitchell explains from Jerusalem. 150 years ago, famed author Mark Twain visited the Holy Land and wrote, it was a desolate country and a silent and mournful expanse. He talks about up in the Jezreel Valley, he talks about how that you can travel in 10 miles in any direction and not see a single person. And so one of the, one of the towns that, that we did some photography was of a small town of Afula, which you know, is really off the map as far as many Westerners are concerned, but it was established in the early 1900s. So 50, 60 years after Mark Twain, there's a small Jewish settlement. And today it's a booming Israeli city that we've been able to match some side-by-side -side perfect photography with it. Doug Hershey and his team chose 200 photographs of Israel from the 1880s to the 1940s. In his new book, Israel Rising, The Land of Israel Reawakens, Hershey chronicles the changes from that time span until today. That's been part of the joy. I mean, we have these old photos of Tel Aviv of less than 100 years ago of shacks on sand dunes with camel caravans on the beach. And to compare it from the exact same angle today, it's just stunning. The book follows Ezekiel's promise where in chapter 36, verse 8, the prophet declared, But you, O mountains of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are about to come. We think of prophecy being to kings or to people or nations, but he's prophesying to the land that when Israel returns as a nation, branches will put forth fruit, uh, waste cities will be rebuilt, the people will be, uh, people and beasts will be multiplied on the land, the land will be cultivated and sown. These side-by-side -side photos show the transformations. Here's Jerusalem near the King David Hotel in the 1930s, and the same view today. This is the Hebrew University campus in 1925, and what it looks like now. From the north in Haifa to the south in Beersheba, Hershey says the pictures represent the prophet's words coming alive. We're living in a really profound time in history. We're living in a time where 26, 2700 year old prophecies from, from Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah, they've been lying dormant for about that long and many of them are coming to pass. The most repeated promise through, through the scriptures is that God will bring his people back to the land and when they do, there's going to be these dramatic changes and we're seeing those. Hershey says the land itself seemed to be waiting for its ancient people to return. To me, it's one of the most profound things here is this land has been conquered you know, 15, 20 different times. It never becomes a homeland for any other people group, and the land would never produce for any other people group. And Israel moves back in, and suddenly the vast desert wastelands are now producing flowers, they're producing fruit. Isaiah 27 talks about how that when uh, Israel returns, Jacob will take root and fill the earth with fruit. And for many centuries, believers would read that and look at that as allegorical or spiritual, and we're finding today it's very literal. It's happening right now. Hershey says the book provides a visual opportunity for those who have never visited Israel, and it's also struck a chord with the younger generations. Most millennials are ready for something real. They want to see something practical. It's as far as the much of 
of um, perhaps theological Christianity that they've been raised on more ideas, uh, they're ready for something solid. They're ready for something real. And so even now when I, when I speak in the States, sometimes I'll have questions about theology or the questions about the land. And usually my answer revolves around, let me show you. you know, come with me to Israel, I'll show you myself. As Israel celebrates its 70th anniversary, Hershey sees Israel as a miracle. Absolutely. I mean, that's Israel is is the time clock, as many people have, have heard and have said. And I believe that as well. I mean, there's so much that is happening here in a very short amount of time. To me, it's one of the most profound miracles of our day. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Amazing photos there. Well, still ahead, you've probably never heard of epigenetics. Learn how you can make your DNA work for you. Welcome back. We've told you before how medical science agrees with wisdom from the Bible, such as the benefits of fasting and forgiveness. But Scripture also talks about visiting the iniquity of the father on the children on the third and fourth generations. As Lori Johnson tells us, medical science has a name for that, epigenetics. Thanks to these new DNA home test kits, you can learn all about your genes and various health issues just by filling one of these tubes with saliva and sending it to the lab. While those results may reveal a lot, they don't always tell the whole story. Expert Dr. Michael Roizen of the Cleveland Clinic compares epigenetics to a light switch. Our behavior can silence our genes or activate them and which of your genes are on or not are to a large degree your choices by things you do. So is epigenetics important? Absolutely. Our DNA is made up of genes. Our behavior, such as what we eat, smoke, even think, dispatch markers to the top of our DNA, which tell our genes to turn on or off. So if you're stressed and not managing it, you're going to turn certain genes on that cause inflammation. Even pregnant mothers can affect their baby's genes, such as those that retain fat. If you don't get enough food during pregnancy, your body, the baby's body, if you will, says, hey, I'm going to come out to an environment that's sparse in food, so I'm going to turn on the genes that allow me to save food and be, if you will, very efficient. That means that when you eat food after you're born, you're going to gain a lot more weight. The reverse is also true. Even if a female is unhealthy before pregnancy, she can turn things around for her offspring if she adopts a healthier lifestyle while she's pregnant. The new field of epigenetics began in 2003 here at Duke University. Dr. Randy Jertle proved DNA is not destiny with his landmark agouti mouse study. The mice carried the agouti gene, causing obesity, diabetes, and jaundice. But when Jertle fed pregnant females lots of vitamins, her offspring ended up thin, healthy, and brown. I feel like we've made a contribution to science that will be there literally forever. Dr. Jertle compares epigenetics to programming a computer. The deterministic part in our system is the DNA. That's the stable part. The free will part comes in through the software that tells that deterministic system how to work. We are, in effect, a programmable computer. That's how we were made. And the behavior of both parents can alter their child's gene expression, and sometimes these changes it, yeah. stick. You can see that, in effect, what God, I think, was telling us is that this is the way you're made. And if you mess with this system, you're not going to alter the genome so much, but you're going to alter your programs. And those, since they're not totally erased necessarily from generation to generation as they go through the egg and the sperm, can literally give rise to problems in the next generation, in the following, in the following, out the four and five generations. As epigenetics research proceeds, scientists hope to pinpoint how specific areas of the genome are affected. Still, one thing's for certain, 
lifestyle choices can bring out the best or worst in our DNA across multiple generations. And that was Lori Johnson reporting their fascinating information and neat how the how science backs up the Bible there. We'll be right back with more of CBN Newswatch. Stay with us. A new CBN program is sweeping Latin America. CBN Mexico's Spanish language program, Vive Mas, has expanded internationally. It can now be found on more than 50 stations in 17 countries. The program is hosted by actor Alan Fernando and singer Nadia and features interviews and stories that help viewers learn how to live a more meaningful life based on biblical principles. That's great. Well, you can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care about most at CBNNews.com. Also, tell us what you think about the stories you've seen here. You can do that by emailing newswatch at CBN.com or talk to us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hope you'll join us next time. Have a great day.